Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes with the Clark College Network Technology Department and this is the NTech 225 CCNA Security Course. Today we'll be looking at Chapter 4, Implementing Firewall Technologies. We'll start off by looking at Access List. This should be a review for you from our Cisco CCNA curriculum. We'll cover different firewall technologies that can be um, implemented using Access List and we'll take a look specifically at zone-based firewalls. Let's start out by looking at ACLs. ACLs can be represented um, this way. You can have standard or extended ACLs. A standard ACL is the most limiting type of ACLs. It only considers the source IP address. It can't consider the port protocol like port 80 or 443. It can't consider the destination address, so it can only filter based on the source. This forces you to usually put the access list as close to the destination as possible, which is the least efficient uh, place to have the ACL because the traffic would have traversed your entire network before being filtered and, and thrown away. It would be much more efficient and effective to do that filtering as soon as possible. Enter extended ACLs, which allow you to look at the source address or the destination address or the port number or any combination of those. So you could, for instance, uh, filter all traffic um, as long as it was on port 80, it would be allowed. Something like that could be done with an extended ACL. So whenever possible, you always want to use extended ACLs. Then these two types of ACLs, standard and extended, come in two different kind of versions. You can have a numbered standard ACL. So if you create a numbered ACL, if it is numbered one through 99, it's gonna be a standard ACL. They then added some extended uh, numbers for IPv4 standard ACLs, 1300 through 1999. So if you number your access list in one of those two number ranges, it will be considered a standard ACL. If you number your access list in one of the extended ranges of 100 through 199 or 2000 through 2699, it will be considered an extended ACL. A newer and much better way to do access lists is named ACLs. So with a named ACL, you have an unlimited number. You're not limited to any number because you don't put a number on your list. You give your list a name like firewall. You give it any kind of name you like. You can't have spaces in the name. The name can't start with a number um, to help avoid confusion with numbered ACLs. But otherwise, you can have some uh, pretty lengthy names and it's also a best practice to put your names in all uppercase. So they kind of jump out at you when you're um, looking over a configuration. I should mention that with IPv6, we get rid of standard ACLs entirely and we get rid of numbered ACLs. So with those gone, it leaves us only one type of ACL, extended named ACLs. So when we move to IPv6, that's all you'll have to work with. So whenever possible, just start working with um, extended named ACLs now so that you're ready to migrate to IPv6. There are other types of non-IP access lists in the numbered ACL ranges. And this shows the numbered ACL ranges for different routed protocols. Apple Talk, IPX, most of these are dead or pretty much dead today. They're just here informationally. We'll only care about the IPv4 ranges. Creating access lists is a two-step process. Step one is, of course, creating an access list. It's a best practice to always do this in a text editor, like a Notepad, Notepad++, some type of a text editor where you can um, backspace and uh, drag and drop things into different order and really kind of think through the process of creating an effective ACL. Then step two, after you have your ACL cut and pasted into the router config is to apply it to an interface. So that doesn't mean that during step one, you don't know where you want to apply it. I always, when I'm writing an ACL, have a pretty good idea where I want to put it, on um, which interface in which direction. 
So do I want to put it on an ingress or an egress interface? Will it go on the, um, you know, the outgoing interface or the incoming? And will um, I put it on router one or router two? I kind of have to know that before I even start writing my access list. But after I've written the access list, it's time to actually commit it to that interface. And so that's what you do in step two. And that would be this, using the access class command, we can um, apply an access list to our VTY interface. So it's access group when it's a physical port interface, it's access class when it's going on a VTY interface. Here's some guidelines, I won't read them over to you. These are in your chapter reading. These are kind of just like best practices. It's a review. So here's looking at access lists. So something new with the newer iOS at Cisco is they now number them for you automatically. So when you create an access list, you'll notice the statements numbered always 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. There's a, they're always numbered 10 apart. This is really cool because it allows you now to edit your list. You can insert additional ACE statements within the list where you want them by giving them a number. In this example, we insert one at five, which would put it at the top of the list and one at 20. Okay. And then you can see that uh, listed out here. And what will happen is next time the router loads, so the next time the router goes through a reload, it'll, it'll actually renumber them 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 again. So they will always end up having 10 apart, so you always have room to insert additional statements. You can also use this um, with the no command, you saw here, no 20. They're able to remove statements without having to, in the past, we had to remove the entire list and then cut and paste a whole new list in. This allows you to go in and surgically remove one or two statements in your list and add a few extras. So this is something to really practice because it's a new capability with the iOS 15. Another annoying feature of iOS 15 that you should be aware of is it will automatically move your access list statements around into a different order for you. Uh, it uh, annoys me greatly, but when you type in your statements, it will try to find the most efficient placement for your statements. So the first time I experienced this, 
I thought that I'd been hacked because I came in and my access list didn't look at all like what I had typed in. And what had actually happened is my statements had just been moved into a different order um, to create a more efficient or more effective um, processing of the statements. So look out for that. Let's talk about how we can mitigate attacks using our ACLs. Right, so here's an example of anti-spoofing with ACLs. Right, so it's, it's cutting out a number of uh, um, a, a number of number ranges that it is preventing from from use. And you can see this is going on the inbound of G00. So that guy sitting at the desk over on the left of the slide is going to be prevented from using any of those IP ranges listed here. So it's going to uh, basically help limit the IP addresses he could spoof or change. So we've removed a lot of the IP ranges that we don't want him to be using. Okay, here would be a look at permitting traffic through a firewall. So a firewall in its simplest sense is nothing more than an access list or a couple. Often I'll have a different access list on uh, the incoming traffic than I do on the outgoing. So you may have two access lists on the same interface, one applied to the in direction and one applied to the out. In this case, um, we're putting in on the inbound serial 000. So the girl on the left of the slide is um, being filtered as the traffic is entering router one. And you can see that things are being permitted here. There's no deny statement, but if you remember, there's an implicit deny any at the end of every access list with IPv4. So IPv4 uh, has an implicit deny any any at the end of the list. You could certainly explicitly add one. You could that's probably a good practice is to put access list 180, deny any, any. And that's a good way to end your list. But you don't have to. There's one there already. You just never see it. But if it gets to the end of the list and it's not permitted, the traffic is discarded. So this list really is only allowing those, you know, six to seven different things there. Hey, this is one dealing with ICMP. You know, ICMP is a great uh, protocol that we use with the ping and the traceroute utilities to do network testing. But it can also be abused um, on the network to find out a lot of uh, information we don't want hackers to know. So we can actually um, use an access list to allow pings, say, from the inside out, but not from the outside in. So we can limit the ability for outsiders to be able to ping our network while still allowing replies to pings to come back in so that we can ping out and get a reply back. And that's what this is showing here, putting these two different um, access lists on the interfaces. Okay, so this is turning off simple network management protocol. There's you know, if you use Cisco Auto Secure, this is one of the 10 things that will disable. You know, one of the last steps is to disable unused services. This is a service that you're likely not using and it should be uh, disabled. Let's talk about IPv6 ACLs. All right, so if you have IPv6 traffic, if you have IPv6 addresses, remember the same interface can have both an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. And you need two different routing protocols, one to handle your IPv4 traffic and one to handle your IPv6. And you need two different access control lists, one to filter your IPv4 traffic and one to filter your IPv6. Can't go away with putting it all on one list. So you would need two different firewalls, essentially one for your IPv6 traffic and one for your IPv4. Remember I said earlier in this presentation, IPv6 only supports extended named ACLs. So it's really a lot easier. You just have one choice and there's the command, IPv6 access list and then whatever name. So it's IPv6 access list, my firewall. 
then it drops you to a sub prompt and then you just bang in statements, deny this, permit this, deny this. So it's, it's really just that easy. Here's an example of one called LAN only. Little different with IPv6 that still has those sequence numbers so that you can come in and um, insert and make changes, but notice they've moved to the right. <laughs> with IPv4, the sequence numbers are listed on the left of the statements, the ACE statements. With IPv6, the sequence numbers are listed on the right with an annoying word sequence. Just the way they do it with IPv6. So they're, they're over there. I liked them better on the left, but things change. Let's talk about firewall technologies. We'll look at a different type of firewall and, and look at the classic firewall and how to configure that. And then we'll talk about design considerations when you're implementing firewalls. All firewalls are resistant to attack. By their very nature, they're hard to attack because their job is to limit traffic are the only transit point between networks because all traffic flows through the firewall. So you want to place your firewall between networks, like certainly between your inside and your outside network protecting you from the outside world. But you can have more than one firewall within your, within your company. Enforce the access control policy. So all firewalls enforce some type of controlled access policy. Types of firewalls. Packet filtering firewall, stateful firewall, application gateway firewall, and a NAT firewall. Right, so a NAT firewall would be what we would use in combination with NAT. So a special firewall for our network address translation. Remember, the numbers change on the packets with NAT. So placement of your firewall, whether it's behind NAT or in front of it, makes a big difference because the number ranges the firewall we'll be encountering will be very different. And a stateful firewall is taking into account the state of the connection. So for instance, allowing, allowing uh, TCP packets to come back through that were allowed out would be a stateful firewall that says, oh, that's part of the same conversation. We allowed that out, so we'll re rely on uh, the return path to be allowed. And the basic packet filtering, which is what we've been looking at with ACLs where we're just looking at layers three and four. Notice that with stateful, we can actually look at the session and we can say, is this part of the same conversation? And then of course, with application gateway, we're looking all the way up to the application layer. Okay, with a standard, just packet filtering firewall, which is just an access control list, this is pretty much the limited things that, that you can do with it simple to implement, it's very effective, but it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. Okay. So like I said, with Stateful, you can actually have basically an automagic firewall entry created for you based on your inside ACL. So based on what statements you type limiting and allowing traffic out of your network, that would be the inside ACL for the outgoing traffic. The stateful firewall will actually write its own network statements to allow traffic to come back in if it's from the same conversation. Pretty cool. And then of course remove them when the conversation concludes. Okay, let's talk about a stateful firewall. Benefits. It's a good primary means of defense. It's got strong packet filtering. It has improved performance over packet filter firewalls. It defends against spoofing and DOS attacks. And it keeps a richer data log of who's doing what and who got denied. So it keeps a lot more information than a standard firewall. It has no application layer inspection. It can't filter stateless protocols. Those are UDP protocols, right? So if you have something using UDP, it can't do that filtering for you. It's difficult to defend against dynamic port negotiations. So some applications um, change their port number. They dynamically change port numbers. So that, that makes it 
difficult for a stateful firewall and it has no authentication support. So no way for you, you to have your users have to authenticate to get out. We can actually set it up so they have to type in a password to, uh, to get the firewall open for them. So let's talk about next generation firewalls, next gen. Granular identification, visibility and control of behaviors within the applications. So it basically learns what the application does and customizes the firewall to suit the application's needs. How about restricting web and web application use based on the reputation of the site? You can sign up for a reputation service that will track the reputation of all the websites and allow you to block email and web access and any access to websites that are known to contain malware or have had problems and they're listed with a bad reputation. So that makes it pretty cool. That's all automatic. It's proactive against, um, you know, in internet threats. So that's that proactive piece. It's enforcement of policies based on a user, a device, a role, an application, and a threat profile. So you way more than just an IP address and a port number. It uh, works well with VPNs, NAT, and SPIs, and it uses um, IPS intrusion prevention um, system technology. So artificial type intelligence to identify when you're under an attack and can close that part of your firewall. It can close down the attack. Let's get into the classic firewall though. That's what we'll be configuring this chapter. It's great to talk about these really advanced solutions, but most companies just need a classic firewall. In fact, most companies, they don't really have a firewall. It's just, it's whatever came in the little router they bought and it's set up however the manufacturer set it up and every hacker in the world knows how to get around that. So being able to just set up a classic firewall for uh, customers is really probably the most valuable thing you can do. So in this case, we want to allow, in this example, an SSH session to go in and out through the firewall. So we would put the firewall together using access list statements. And here's how we configure a classic firewall. We use what's called inspection rules. And so they're just firewall rules that we, you know, they're much like an ACL statement. They're going to be firewall rules. What's um, important with them is they allow the communication to come back, right? So they are tracking an established session. They're sometimes called an inspection list. You're gonna do a lab where you get to do those. Let's talk about firewalls and network design. Inside and outside networks, right? So usually we have two different profiles. Like I alluded to, you have, almost, you have really two different lists. What's allowed out and what's allowed in. You know, very rarely do we allow anything in unless it's a reply to something we allowed out. So we would keep a log of all the traffic that was allowed out, that had gone out, and if there was a corresponding piece of traffic coming back from that same conversation, we would generally allow it back in. That's what um, the firewall would do. But it wouldn't allow any uninitiated communications from the outside. So no access from the outside to reach the inside unless they had been invited in by a trusted device inside our network. So for this reason, because we like to set our firewalls up this way, we create a demilitarized zone we call the DMZ. You know, North Korea and South Korea have a demilitarized zone and this is a similar um, concept. The idea is kind of a, kind of a semi-vulnerable, semi-protected area. It's not as protected as your private inside network and it's not as vulnerable as the outside public network. So we have a different set of firewall rules. So if you were on the public network, we would have a rule that would never allow you to initialize or initiate a communication to the inside private network. But we would allow certain communications to be initiated. Say we're running a web server, then we'll allow port 80 connections and maybe port 443 connections to be initiated from the unknown outside world into our DMZ. So the DMZ allows selective access. 
Right. Notice also we are going to limit the private inside network from accessing our own DMZ for safety. Because if someone compromises the DMZ, we don't want the DMZ to be a launch point for them to gain access to the private network. Do you see how this is architected? So if you're inside the network, you frustratingly can't get to the DMZ. Can't get to your own web server from inside, right? So you're blocked. You're not allowed to... Uh, to get traffic in and out, right? Well, we usually lax that rule. And again, like we do with the internet, if it's initiated from the private, usually we can reply back from the internet or the DMZ. But the DMZ could never initialize any uh, communications into the private um, network. So that's the concept here, kind of three zones. Um, and they'll move us into zonal firewalls. And often we'll add a fourth zone for wireless. Often we have different rules. We have, want to add extra restrictions on our wireless network than we do maybe on the private network. So again, this is what we would call zone-based, where you break your network up into zones and create different firewall policies for each of your zones. And you create uh, what's called trust levels. So higher trusted areas are allowed to um, are allowed to connect to anything at or below, but if you're uh, a lower number, then you're not allowed to connect to higher numbers, basically. So the two private lands would be equal. They'd be allowed to exchange information essentially as if there was no firewall there with little to no restrictions. But the DMZ and the public network would be highly restricted from being able to access either of the lands. We want to think about a layered defense. We want to protect our core. That's where we have our sensitive servers and our core routers and all the important equipment. So we definitely want to have a firewall around the core. We also want perimeter security where the perimeter is typically facing the internet, right? So internet security. And then we want endpoint security. That's facing our internal users. We're still afraid of the people that work for us. So we want to do sometimes called port security or endpoint security. Uh, we want to do things down at the switch level um, that are restricting what our users are able to do. And we want to add security to the communications that take place. And here's a whole bunch of best practices. One is deny all traffic by default and then just permit things as needed, right? That would be the most secure way to go. Just say, nope, say no to everything. And then I add above that. So you have to come in and add a permit every time you're going to make an exception. All right, this is permitted. Because remember, once it hits a match, it's done with the list. So you'd have an, a deny any at the end of your list and your list would have nothing but permit statements. The few things you allow, you would add a permit statement. Everything else would be denied. It's very important to monitor your firewall logs. Well, one, you have to set up logging. So set up a syslog server and have the firewall send the log messages there and have a human being that it's part of their job duty to monitor that log and look for people trying to break in, people trying to do things. Also, it can catch legitimate traffic that's being denied. Maybe the application your company uses and relies on went through, uh, you updated it, and now it's using an extra port that you haven't been allowing. You can catch that pretty easily if you're just looking at the log. You're like, wow, we're getting hundreds of hits on this port I'm blocking. And it wouldn't take very long to uh, you know, investigate what application is using that port. I often sometimes will just Google a port number and it'll tell you what applications are using it. All right, zone-based firewalls. It's not dependent on access control lists. Okay. Router security posture is to block unless explicitly allowed. Policies are easy to read and troubleshoot. One policy affects any given traffic instead of needing multiple ACLs and inspection actions. So we create policies and we only need one policy. So we don't have to have all these overlapping lists. Like we talked about, you can use it between LAN and the internet between public servers. You can use it uh, with redundant firewalls or complex firewalls. The first design step is determining the zones. What, what's got a similar trust posture? Is your wireless all the same? 
At Clark College, it's not. We have employee wireless and we have student wireless. And as you might imagine, employee wireless, you can do more things than you can on the student wireless. I know, you're like, come on, that's not fair. That's the way it is. And we similarly in our lands have two different lands. We have um, one land that's student facing, that's the labs for the student labs, and we have a different land for the employees. So there's, there's lots of differences that you might have to determine. I recommend trying not to get too granular where you're creating too many zones. They can be hard to maintain and differentiate. So make sure there's a real differentiation, that there's a real reason for creating the separate zones. Like I said, you'll typically always have three and sometimes four. You'll always have the inside network, which is highly trusted, the outside network, the internet that's highly untrusted, and the in-between DMZ, demilitarized zone, which is where you throw things that need access to the outside or access from the outside. And occasionally a, a wireless network or some other fourth type of uh, zone. Okay, these are essentially the steps it goes through. It's going to inspect, so ZPF, zone-based, is going to inspect your packets as they come in. And a drop statement is analogous to a deny statement in ACL. And you have an option to log rejected packets, which is helpful if something's being denied. You can add a log on there so that you get detailed information about what packets are being dropped. And pass is analogous to permit, right? So it's pretty much just changed the words on you. So you can see the status is here on whether it results in a pass or a drop. And it's based on, like I said, the trustworthiness of one zone to another. <coughs> okay. So first you'd create the zones, then identify the traffic that you want to filter with what's called a class map, and then define the actions on that filtered traffic with the policy map. Then you connect those to your zone, right? Identify a zone pair and match it to a policy map, right? So you're gonna identify the traffic you wanna filter, you're gonna uh, identify the actions you wanna take, and then you're gonna have a zone pair. You say, okay, we're gonna filter traffic between zone A and zone B. That sounds complicated. It is a lot more complicated because it's a lot more granular. Again, it's not appropriate for every um, every situation. So here we're creating a zone. That's not too hard, right? Zone security private, zone security public. We just created a private and public zone, done. Then you have to create the class map. Right, so the class map is going to be a series of inspect statements. You're going to need one for each type of traffic you want to, um, to put in there. So create the class map and then add your statements for each protocol you want. Okay, this is a look at doing that. So here we make a class map called HTTP traffic. Okay. And we list the traffic we want to match, which is HTTP, HTTPS, and DNS. So that's the traffic we want to filter. Now, remember, we need a policy map next that says, well, what are we going to, what are we going to do if we have a match, right? This is just saying what to match, what to look for in the flow of traffic running through the router. This is what we want to look for. Then we're going to define some actions to take on that traffic. And so we create the policy map. All right, and so here's a policy they made down at the bottom of the slide, private to public policy, okay? And notice it's just referencing that class map that we made in the previous slide. That was the name of the class map, HTTP traffic. So we're simply saying that we want to monitor traffic between two zones and the filter list we wanna use between the two zones is gonna be the HTTP traffic. It'll take some practice. You have a lab where you do this. 
that's a hard thing with lecturing on, on commands. You really have to get in the lab and do these commands. Okay, and then you assign interfaces on the router to the zones because the router doesn't know the gig zero zero interfaces in the private zone, right? This is where it really gets real. Is sure, we made up these zones, private and public, but the router doesn't know which physical interface goes to which zone because they're just names. Now you're associating the name with an interface. You're telling router one, your gig zero zero port is in the private zone. Your S zero 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 port is in the public zone. So that's gonna be really important. So the router knows now when traffic is flowing between private and public, it can use that um, group filter list to be able to inspect the traffic. Okay. Here's some uh, kind of considerations. Only one zone is allowed per interface. That, that makes sense, right? If you have a interface. Now, if you have sub interfaces, you could, you could actually do it on the sub interface and have different zones on different sub interfaces because they're treated just like an interface. But what it's saying is on gig zero zero, it can't be assigned to two zones. And of course, no filtering happens intra zone. That means even if it's two different ports, say you had gig zero zero and gig zero one, but they were both in zone private, uh, no filtering will apply. Uh, firewalls don't filter uh, within a zone. It's only externally from zone to zone. Great. Thank you. Have some fun with the labs. They're really going to be critical this week in making sense of all of this.